Hi everyone and welcome to this video looking at the multiple choice section of the 2014 National 5 Chemistry paper. This video will be useful to you if you have already tried this part of the paper. I will show the working required for each of the questions so that you know where the answers have came from. Let's start by looking at question 1. Question 1 is looking at average rate, so you need to look at the front of your data book where you can find the equation for average rate and it's shown as delta quantity over delta time. Our quantity is 60 and our time is 20 and that's as far as this question is taking it so your answer is 60 divided by 20. For question 2 you've been given a definition for the word chiral which means that molecules have four different groups attached to a carbon atom and you just have to go through each of the answers until you find one which fits that definition. The first one has a bromine, a chlorine and two hydrogens so there are not four groups there. The second one only has two different types of group attached. The third one has three different types of group and the last one has the four different groups that would make it chiral. For question three, you're looking for the charge on the zinc ion and zinc phosphate, and they've given you the formula there. So you'll need to use page eight of your data book and a little bit of algebra to work this one out. So if you go to page eight, you'll find that phosphate ions have a charge of three minus. You have two phosphate ions, so in total you have a six minus for the negative part of this ionic compound. There is no charge on the whole thing, so the zinc has to balance this out. So you have three zinc ions, and in total they must balance it out by being six positive. So z each zinc ion has to be worth two plus. You know that zinc is a metal, so it would have to be a positive answer, and you've got a choice there between two and three. Here we have a balanced equation example. The best way to tackle one of these is just to try and balance the equation yourself. So we have Fe2O3 plus carbon monoxide to give us iron and three carbon dioxides. So underneath the arrow, if you write down the elements that we have present and just how many you have on each side. So here we've got two irons and we have three plus another one. We have four oxygens and one carbon. Here we have one iron, we have three times two, which is six oxygens and three carbons. So the first thing we should balance off is the iron. So if we put a two in front of the iron, that will balance that out. And now we need to balance our oxygen and carbon. So if we go for the carbon, you can see that we have three on this side and only one here. So if we put a three in front of the carbon monoxide that balances our carbons but at the same time it increases our oxygens. So we now have three plus three which would be six. So you can see that all three of your elements are now balanced and you're looking for these coefficients within the answers. So we're needing x to equal three and y to equal two. So your answer is c. Here this is a definition question. So an acidic solution contains, and you know that it's to do with hydrogen ions, so we can score out the hydroxide ion one there and this one here. So we have a choice between only hydrogen ions or more hydrogen than hydroxide ions. Acidic solutions are in water and water has the dissociation into hydrogen and hydroxide, so there will be some hydroxide there. So your answer is C, more hydrogen ions than hydroxide ions. question six you're going to need your data book and you're going to need to have a look at page eight which has the solubility grid at the bottom. Here we have which of the following oxides when shaken with water would give an alkaline solution. So the first things that we need to think about are for alkaline solutions. Number one it needs to be soluble and number two it needs to come from a metal oxide. Okay, non-metal oxides will form um, acids. So if we deal with our first one here, we're looking for which ones would be soluble. So calcium oxide is soluble. Nickel oxide is insoluble. And then we have nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide. 
we have a look, they don't fit our second criteria because they are non-metal oxides, so we can just score those out. And then that gives us our answer of A, calcium oxide. Which of the following compounds is not a salt? So if something is not a salt, then it's hinting to you that it will be a base. Bases are either metal hydroxides, metal oxides, or metal carbonates. So we're looking for one of those within here, and we have D, magnesium hydroxide. That is our base, which is not a salt. Question eight, the spectator ions in the reaction above are. So for spectator ions, you're looking for things which are identical on each side of the arrow, including their uh, state symbols. So if we take each of them in turn and try and find them on the other side. So we've got H plus aqueous, and we don't have an H plus aqueous over here, so that has to stay. We have NO3 minus aqueous and NO3 minus aqueous. So there's one of our first spectator ions. K plus aqueous and K plus aqueous. There's our second spectator ion, OH minus aqueous, and then we've got water being formed over here. So our two spectator ions are K plus aqueous and NO3 minus aqueous. So that would give us an answer of A. The molecular formula for cyclohexane is so one of the ways you could do this is to draw out cyclohexane. So cyclohexane has six carbons and they are arranged in a ring. That is what the cyclo part means. Okay, so here are our six carbons and each of them needs to have a valency of four. So we draw in the hydrogens to make up for that. And if you count them up, you'll find that we have a formula of C6H12. The other way you could do this is if you know your general formula for the cyclohex for the cycloalkane family is CnH2n, and just simply find which of the formulae fits this general formulae. So we'll find that that is C. For question 10, we're being asked to name this molecule. I'm going to redraw it out without any of the hydrogens, just for clarity. For a question like this, like you did with the balanced equation example, you should just try and name this yourself without actually looking at the answers first. So we're trying to find the longest chain. Okay, so our longest chain is going to be one of four carbons and we need to number it from the end closest to a branch that's here. So we've got one, two, three, four. So we know that the name is going to end in butane. We have a branch here containing one carbon, so we know that that is a methyl, and it's on number two. So we have two methyl butane. Then have a look at the answers and try and find your answer. So here we go, two methyl butane is B. Question 11 is more of a problem solving type question here. Petrol is a mixture of hydrocarbons. The tendency of a hydrocarbon to ignite spontaneously is measured by its octane number. And you're given a range of hydrocarbons and their octane numbers. A student made the hypothesis that as the chain length of a hydrocarbon increases, the octane number increases. Which set of three hydrocarbons should have their octane numbers compared? So you're looking for something where only the chain number increases. So if we have a look at number one, you have a chain of five with a branch on it. So I'm just going to write down, we have five here plus a branch. Number two, we have butane, which is four carbons. Number three, we have pentane, which is five carbons. Number four, two methylpentane, that's another five plus a branch, but the branch is just in a different place. Number five has only got six carbons. And then here we have cyclopentane with a branch. So that's a ring plus a branch. So a completely different type of hydrocarbon. So we're looking for the three which just have an increase in their branch length, in their chain length. So that would be butane, pentane and hexane. So that's number two, number three and number five. So that gives you an answer for C. Propane reacts with hydrogen bromide to form two products. So you see here we have propane with a double bond um, at the one position and we're adding on HBr. When we add on HBr there are two positions that the Br can go into. It can either fall into this middle section or it can go onto the end carbon because this is an asymmetrical molecule. Which of the following alkenes do not form two products on reaction with hydrogen bromide? 
So you're looking for something which is a symmetrical molecule. So if we just draw out the basic structure for each of these. So for butyronine, we have four carbons with a double bond here. This means that when you add on hydrogen bromide, you would have two options. You would have the option where the bromide can go on the end carbon or it can go on the second carbon. So this cannot be our answer. If we look at butene, we have a double bond in the middle here. When we add on HBr, we can either have our Br be here or it can be on this carbon. Now if we have a look at both of these, they're just mirror images of each other, so they are in fact the same molecule, so we're only getting one product. So that means that B is our answer. If we quickly look at C and D, so pentene is much like the butyronine example, except we've just got an extra carbon on the end, so you'd end up with similar answers. And pentene, you would still end up with either a Br here or here. Okay, but they would be different molecules. Which of the following alcohols has the highest boiling point? Use your data book to help you. So if you see a question which tells you that you may wish to use your data book, you need to find a page to help you out. So in this case, you're looking at page nine of the data book and you just need to work out what the boiling points are of all of these molecules. So we have 97, 82, 118, and 100. So we want the highest boiling point and that is butan 1 all. Okay, question 14. A reaction is endothermic if. So here you have to think about what explanations you have for endothermic reactions. It might be easier to, for you to think of it from the exothermic point of view. So an exothermic reaction is one where heat is given out during the reaction, so that would rule out B straight away. If exothermic is where heat is given out, then endothermic would be where heat is taken into the reaction. Now, the slightly counterintuitive fact of this is that your temperature will actually fall and it will become colder because you're taking energy from the surroundings. So for 14, your answer is C, the temperature drops during the reaction. Question 15, which of the following metals will not react with a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid? Here you need to look at page 10 of your data book and anything that is above H on the scale will react with acid. Anything below will not react. If you have a look at that then you'll find that copper is the only one here which is below H on the scale. So that is the one which will not react with acid. Which metal can be extracted from its oxide by heat alone? Again, you could use page 10 to help you. You're looking for one of the unreactive metals, which will be silver. The ion electron equations for the oxidation and reduction steps in a reaction between sulfite ions and iron three ions are given below. The redox equation for the overall reaction is so here we are trying to combine these two reactions. To combine them, we need to make sure that the electrons are equal. And you can see that in the first reaction we have two electrons, but in the second we only have one. So that entire reaction has to be multiplied by two. So that now gives us two equations. We'll have H2O plus SO3 2 minus to give you SO4 2 minus plus 2H plus plus two electrons and now we'll have two Fe3 plus plus two electrons to give you two Fe2 plus. You can cancel the electrons out almost like they were spectator ions and now you just combine what is left over. So we have H2O plus SO3 2 minus plus two Fe3 plus to give us SO4 2 minus plus two H plus plus 2 Fe2 plus. So purely just taking everything that is on the left hand side of the arrow and joining it together and everything that was on the right hand side of the arrows joining that together. If we now have a look at our answers we'll find that our answer for this is B. Question 16 
question 18, which of the following pairs of metals would give the highest reading on the voltmeter? So you need page 10 of your data book again, and you're looking for the metals which are furthest apart on that scale. So the two that are furthest apart from the options we have here are magnesium and silver, with magnesium being quite close to the top and silver being right down at the bottom. If you pair those up, you've got the greatest difference, so you'll have the greatest reading on your voltmeter. Question 19. We have part of a condensation polymer here and we've been given one of the monomers. We need to find the structure of the other monomer. The thing you need to have a look for here, if we've got a condensation polymer, we need to have a functional group that is formed by condensation reactions. So the functional group we have here is your ester link. And if you just ignore the fact this is part of a polymer to begin with and think about where would you cut that if that was an ester link. And ester links are always cut between the C double bond O and the O. So that will give you one of your monomers here. And then you're going to go along to the next one and cut them. And you've got this third monomer in the middle. You now need to have a look at the structures of what you have and compare them to what you've been given. So here we have a C6H4 section. So that's this part here. We've got the C double bond O on each side. And as we've hydrolyzed this, and we've added water back on, we've added the OH back on to each of these C's to make the carboxylic acid groups. That leaves us behind with this section. If we have used water to split this, then it will be an H that will go on to each of those O's to give you a diol. And now you just need to find the structure in the question, which is B. Question 20, the type of reaction represented by the equation above is. So first of all, you need to know the definitions for each of these. So an addition reaction is one where you would be adding something onto a double bond. We don't have any double bonds here. That would be carbon chemistry. Displacement is where you would put a metal into a solution of a less reactive metal and you would displace that out of the solution. We don't have that happening here either. Neutralisation is where you would take an acid and a base and you produce a salt and water. We're not producing a salt and water here. Which leaves us with precipitation as our answer. The definition of precipitation is where we take two aqueous solutions. When we mix them together, we, are, we produce a solid uh, product. So we have precipitation as we have solid barium sulphate being produced here. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful. Please give this a thumbs up if you have. Remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem for regular updates on new videos.